Hi there, I'm John Michael Garropy, and I'm here with Shane Butler, director of The Candy Tin, one of the 19 films that's going to be at the Popcorn Roulette Film Festival. How are you doing, Shane? Good. How are you doing, John? Glad to be with you. I'm doing great. I'm I'm really glad to have you along. Uh, why don't you tell us, explain a little bit to us uh, what The Candy Tin is about? So The Candy Tin is the story of an antique that travels through the generations of a family in modern America. It's a very good uh, story. It's got a lot of different scenes. And I was actually kind of wondering about that. Just in general, like you've you've chosen a story that has uh, a lot of different set pieces, a lot of different actors. Um, a lot of directors would just go for something really simple, one location, two people. Uh, what drives you to actually make something more complex like this? So, I mean, probably if I would do it again, I probably wouldn't make something that's <laughs> complex. <laughs> Um, I mean, so we did have, so we have six time periods. So it goes from the 1920s, the 1940s, the 50s, the 70s, the 2000s, and then the future. And uh, there are something like with speaking lines, maybe around like 20 actors with speaking lines. And then there are two kind of, I guess, set pieces um, at a diner in the 1950s, and then a party in the 1970s, a house party, which had, you know, a number of extras. And yeah, what drove me, I think, so I had this idea for a while. Um, and it's kind of, I've been rum ruminating in, on it for a number of years. Um, it kind of came about when uh, I was selling, we were selling my grandparents' house. Um so you're going through a lot of those objects, like as anybody knows that sold a house that's kind of been in the family for a while, you come across a lot of different objects uh, from the past. And actually kind of what got me thinking about, there was this down in the basement, there was a saltine cracker tin that's pretty big. What, what happened to it, you know, it was obviously bought a number of years ago. It could have been used by a kid, you know, like my uncle or something like that in different kind of aspects and whatever. And like, you know, what's the life of it? And, you know, is it thrown away? Does it end up in a landfill? Does somebody pick it up in the landfill? Is it sold to, you know, an antique dealer or something like that? Is it put in a thrift shop? Uh, just so, you know, the story of, a you know, an object through time was really interesting to me. Mm. And then the other kind of influence of it was there's a short story, The Cut Glass Bowl uh, by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yes. Uh, which I do reference at the very end. That was going to be like one of my questions. Please tell me all kinds of things about cut glass. Because <laughs> you so that's a, Yeah, so that is a right in there for a reason. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do reference it. So the story of the cut glass bowl was it's of a family and it starts off, you know, oh, there was this age, this age, and now this is the cut glass age. And it's about this family, the disintegration of a family um, with three different time periods of a couple of years apart. And it's like the cut glass bowl almost has this like supernatural quality to it that's affecting their life. I wanted to see kind of this family through generations. And, you know, I like the different time periods of the 20th century, you know, the fashion, the, the, I guess the set design, you would call it, you know, like furniture, that kind of thing. So I thought it would be interesting to show. And then also how America has changed mm. uh, throughout the years, I thought would be very interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously, this story has a lot to do with just the nature of objects and what we keep and what we don't. What is what is your relationship to objects? What what do you have in your own house? Do you keep small mementos? And how does it work with you? I do. I do have a number of I do. Also, I like little little things. I actually I so I was just in Gettysburg like a week and a half ago. So I bought I, anytime I go to a museum or like a historical place, I always buy like little little trinkets and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I have kind of old stuff from that's like meaningful to my family. And like you pick up a little like a little toy soldier or something like that. Uh, so I do tend to I think it maybe runs in my family, like a hoarding tendency, perhaps yeah. <laughs> a little bit like very reverential towards objects, maybe like up to a unhealthy degree somewhat. Um, so that, you know, obviously that played a part in wanting to to play this, you know, see the story out, because obviously if it ended up in a different family or whatever, like the candy tin could have just been thrown away. But, you know, the candy tin goes through the family and all that. You have a tremendous amount of objects just in this film in the first place. Do you own most of those things or where did you get all that stuff from? So it does vary. So I did have a great set designer, Steph South, uh, who did a really good job. Uh, 
in getting a lot of the different, like, you know, the radio, some different stuff for the 70s. She did a lot of stuff to dress up that set because it was obviously like a modern house, you know, and mm-hmm. everything. Uh, and just like those little objects that kind of make it look uh, vintage. I mean, I still have the stuff in a basement somewhere, um, a lot of the stuff. Uh, but it's specifically the like the Christmas scene, actually, a lot of that is from my family, like the little manger, the nativity scene. That's the like the it's from the, like the 1960s. It was my grandparents first nativity scene. And I always liked it because it's so little and fun. Yeah. Um, so a lot of those objects from there were like, you know, from my mom's house and everything like that. You threw in, in the 1950s sequence, uh, a quick reference to On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Mm-hmm. I was kind of curious about uh, your thought process on the book On the Road and Kerouac's thought process that your first thought is the best thought. What do, what do you think about that idea? Well, one, I appreciate that you picked up on that reference. <laughs> it's very quick. It's super quick. Yeah. And it's like very deep cut because it's from like i think a letter he wrote to somebody <laughs> <laughs> you made me google i did i didn't know it off the top of my head <laughs> okay yeah, yeah yeah i mean honestly i probably read it on like wikipedia or something like yeah. that but i always <laughs> the script was originally much longer mm. i know i pack in a lot yeah in a short amount of time but it was actually much longer it was i think when i originally wrote it was maybe 26 or 30 pages or something like that um, and I really had fleshed out the the 50s scene and the 70s scene with some more characters to tell kind of a fuller story there. Um, and I'm a big fan of On the Road, so that's why I put it in. So originally, like, that was a part of the scene. But in terms of first thought, best thought, I would say I wish I followed that more often. Mm. Sometimes I could be paralyzed by the editing process. There is truth to that in terms of, like, Jack Kerouac. I know he would write a lot of notes throughout his travels and everything. And it would be kind of percolating for a while. And then, you know, he would sit down for like, you know, whatever, two, three weeks on barbiturates and everything. Right. Right. And, you know, write out the scroll and everything and write a very stream of consciousness, which I think there can be something to that. Cause a lot of times I think at least with the writing process or the editing process, you can get bogged down in like, which direction am I going to go and bogged down by choice. So it would be helpful to think first thought is best thought, and then you can kind of edit later. And then a lot of times you see, oh, well, this was pretty good. Eventually, right. You know? <laughs> well, I got one last question before we end up going out, and it's the completely unfair question. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your director's statement at the end of uh, the description for this film that you put out uh, ends with the question, what does the candy tin say about modern America that you wanted to ask your audience what this film or what the tin would say about modern America. And I'm curious what your thought process on this happens to be. What does the candy tin say about modern America? Well, I would be curious what an audience would say. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I think I have made movie, a movie in the past where I was a little more, uh, you know, forceful and like kind of, pontificating about things and stuff whereas this one i kind of think i want to raise more questions in a like subtle way and whether i did that or not i have no idea you know yeah Um, i will say i think what i would say what does the tin say about modern america in the construction of the scenes i made them mirror each other there's the scene in the candy store at the beginning and then there's a couple at the end there's the family scene, the second scene, and then the fifth scene in a family, um, and then the two teenage scenes. So I was very purposeful that I did that. Um, and if you look at the, it's like a happy family in the 40s, and mm-hmm. then in the the fifth scene in the 2000s, it's a uh, you know broken down family. So that was purposeful. And then I think. One of the things, and I think you mentioned this in one of your questions, maybe I don't think you asked it, but about like kind of nostalgia and everything right. like that. And I think a lot of times similar to like Midnight in Paris, I guess it's kind of similar to Midnight in Paris, but it's like you, people get caught up too much in nostalgia. Mm. Um, and I think the best way to look at the past is like you take the good parts, obviously, and you put it towards the future. So when I constructed, when I constructed the last scene in the antique store, which is in the future, costumes i purposely made it so that it was somewhat modern retro 
like a classic was, look like a classic look but like he wasn't wearing like you know a white shirt white button down and like a solid black tie i wanted to do it like you know he's kind of mashing patterns and a little more modern fresh look but also like obviously no one walks around wearing suits anymore right so i kind of wanted to be like all right in this like future 20 years maybe we've gone back to like wearing suits so i kind of wanted to create like a like a future past kind of thing and it's like was is this going to happen and then that goes along with at the very end um you can't really say it i wish i hung on a little bit longer but the baseball autograph baseball is barry bonds oh okay so that was my favorite player and as everyone knows barry bonds great great player whatever but tarnished that he did steroids so right it's kind of like you have to take like you know you have to take the good parts and move on to yeah. the future. Not too uh, unlike Babe Ruth, which we start this off with, was a great baseball player, had a very checkered past, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, a lot of times people romanticize the past, but it's like I would describe like that future scene as almost like a future past, I mm -hmm. would say. That's how I intended it. Whether it comes across <laughs> that way, I have no idea. But <laughs> I, I, I'm sure a lot of people are going to pick up on a lot of these details when they end up watching your film. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, Shane, for coming on, talking about your film. Uh, it's going to be a great time. We're going to be at HC Media's Studio 101 in Haverhill, Massachusetts on September 24th. And we're going to be showing films from 5 p.m. all the way on into the night. Thanks, John. Glad to be with you. You as well. Hey, have yourself a good night, okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much.